Hello and welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be talking all about this Bronica ETRSI and as it says in the title, I'm going to be going over why I think it's the best value and the biggest bargain available in medium format. There are cheaper cameras out there, but this camera offers the, the best combination of features to price. That ratio is higher here than I believe anywhere else. And I'll go through it following my usual format. So I'll talk you through the camera. I'll talk you through kind of the alternatives, where it sits in the market. And this will culminate in me taking it out, putting a roll of portrait through it, showing the pictures off. Um, you've seen one of my videos before, you know what to expect. This camera here is a Bronica ETRS-I and the, the S and the SI were later models. Originally produced uh, in 19, I think 76, they had the ETR. Later models added new features and this is one of the last models produced up to 2004, I believe, which uh, gives it a couple of modern things. Um, for one, if you put a exposure, sort of an, uh, a metered prism on this, you can actually get aperture priority, which is great for medium format. Another reason these Bronicas have stayed a bit cheaper is because unlike Pentax, Mamiya and Hasselblad, they never had a digital evolution. So they didn't have, um, for example, Leaf Aptus or even sort of, you know, the, the digital backs that Hasselblad have on the H1 and the, the Pentax 645Z. Essentially what I'm saying is that this lens system was never adapted to digital and therefore people don't still use the lenses on digital. If you look at some of the old Mamiya lenses, you'll have people trying to adapt them forwards. The Hasselblad, the HC lenses are still phenomenally expensive, but these Zenzenons are good performers and, uh, and yeah, you save a bit of money by not having digital backs out there. This is a system camera, which means that it's completely configurable by the user for whatever purpose you might want to use it for. This one I've got in kind of walk around modes. Um, if I just take this hood off, I'll show you some of the, the things you can do to it. It's a fairly lightweight camera. Obviously, if you're coming from 35 mil, you are gonna have a bit more bulk and a bit more weight to deal with, but it's on the smaller end. Um, obviously, a six by four five is gonna be smaller in frame size, but also in weight than things like six by six and six by seven. The way that you configure this camera is unbelievably easy. They actually have little catches dotted around the body that allow you to just take things off, put things on. If I take it now from, I guess I turned this walkabout mode and I put it into studio portrait mode, you'll see that all I have to do is uh, a press on the top and I take the, the viewfinder off. I'm just gonna take my cap off the, the metered prism, which slides on with a click. And likewise, I can take my winding handle off and you might wonder why I'm doing that. The reason is, if I just pop that off, I can get something like this speed grip, which uh, slides on the bottom. And what was that? About 15, 20 seconds. I've taken this from small and light to admittedly a bit heavier and bulkier, but I get a nice shutter button on the grip. Obviously this works better for vertical pictures. And um, yeah, this is the AE Prism 2. This allows me to do aperture priority. Uh, you can see on the back, I've got this little dial. Incredibly flexible um, because it's almost point and shoot simple. You do have to manually focus, but apart from that, in this configuration without flash, it is very much just uh, make sure the readout is a reasonable speed for hand holding and press the shutter. One thing this camera doesn't have is a fully mechanical operation. The the back and the uh, the winding is fairly mechanical, but the shutter and the aperture are very much controlled by a battery. It does take one of the classic LR44s, so it's not like it's got weird batteries that cost a lot. It's, uh, it's fairly standard for cameras, but Without the battery, you're gonna have nothing but one 500th of a second shutter-wise. Um, I'm pretty sure that the aperture you can adjust, but yeah, not so good without the battery. I would recommend using it with one. One advantage of this is that whereas the mechanical shutters, uh, for example, on the Hasselblad V-mounts, will go down from one 500th all the way to one second, with the Bronica ETRS and its battery-powered shutter, you can actually have exposure times of up to eight seconds, which is pretty nice. The 
the, one of the benefits of that is because exposure times between one and eight seconds are actually the most uh, difficult to do sort of judged by hands. I know that um, you can do it if you kind of, I'm just gonna grab this prop from our screen. If you are holding your cable release, you can sort of look at your watch and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But the, the, the margin of error is actually largest in that area. In the same way that, for example, you'd never try and bulb one five hundredth of a second, anything you bulb before about 20 seconds is going to have a large margin of error. If you think about slide films where half a stop is actually quite a significant difference, um, having the shutter that lets you go up to eight seconds is a real plus. That's enough about the shutter. Um, I'm just going to unscrew this and take it out. I think it's great how, um, although you could get cheaper things, like folding cameras or TLRs, you do get all the benefits of the configurability. Um, for example, just the option to have two backs is an enormous benefit for some people. This one here is loaded with portrait and I could, for example, have this one loaded with fancy expensive color film and this one loaded with black and white, or even this one loaded with portrait and this one loaded with slide film. Just the ability to kind of take the back off the camera, not shoot the whole roll at once, and uh, and sort of switch between films for different circumstances. There are some scenes and even some kind of weather conditions that just really lend themselves to black and white. And if you have something like uh, a TLR, or um, in my experience, I used to shoot with a Pentax 6.7, I'd get a really expensive slide film almost stuck in the camera, and I'd be there saying, oh, don't really want to waste Velvia on um, an overcast day, but I really like this scene. Um, it feels wrong, I don't know about you guys, but I never like to kind of put black and white conversions on things like Portra because I'd much rather spend HP5 money than, uh, than Portra money. But get one of these and change your backs. That solves the problem for you. In terms of operation of this camera, we're gonna cut to a couple of close-ups so I can kind of walk you through the, the ins and outs. Um, these videos obviously are intended to, uh, well, I'm not sort of working for Bronica, but if you went out based on this video and bought a Bronica, I'd like by the end of this for you to understand the operation of the camera. Uh, let's start by breaking this down into kind of constituent parts. The lens pops off with that clasp at the bottom left of the front plate and the, uh, the viewfinder likewise. At the back right, there's a little catch slide it back and that comes off. Once you take the back off using the little pin at the bottom of the left side of the body, you get essentially the camera, it's a little cube. I could strip this down further by taking the winding crank and the focusing screen out, but that seems a little bit over the top. The back, obviously you're gonna use one of the either um, 15 frames or 30 frame 220 backs, whatever you shoot. That's the, that's the part that's least customizable. Uh, but that, that pops on with two blocks at the top the lens barrel is a bayonet like most of uh, this era. And uh, actually that's the that's the ways finder cap. But what I'll do in a sec is put the uh, the A2 metered prism on. So using the clasp, if I just slide that back, what you'll see is the uh, the contact pins at the top there are what essentially give the, the meter the ability to tell the camera how to fire an aperture priority mode. So this one just slides on. Um, if you look at the back right of the prism, you can see the A, red, and M. So that's A for auto or aperture priority. Red is just off and M is manual. There's your film setting on the other side as well. On the right side of the camera body, we have some more tools. Um, you've got your mirror lockup at the front, which is used to produce a bit of vibration. That's your multiple exposure lever. The winding crank is fairly self-explanatory that not only recocks the shutter, but advances your frame, moves your frame counter on and uh, releases the kind of the mirror back in the middle of the body. On the other side of the camera, you've got your shutter speed and that goes between one five hundredth and eight seconds. Pretty decent bit of kit. At the bottom, the little screw thread is where you put your adapter in. This will fire with the shutter on the, uh, the middle position as well as the, uh, the kind of the, the down open position but if you wanna use that on a tripod, not a bad idea. The little one behind it is for the SCA flash adapters. Honestly, <laughs> I wouldn't use that. I would just completely ignore that. Maybe put a little bit of cover over it, but not important. 
Focus and aperture is down on the lens barrel. And again, that's pretty standard for most medium format. This little lever allows you to do the depth of field preview. So you get full time in your viewfinder, depth of field stuff, useful if you're hyperfocally. Sorry for the slightly questionable camera work, but this is the shutter speed readout as you see it in the viewfinder. The camera shows you what it will fire at in aperture priority mode, but obviously if you are in manual mode, you'll have to input this yourself onto the shutter speed dial. One thing I find quite useful is that the camera will give you a green shutter speed readout if you're at a acceptable hand holding speed, an orange shutter speed readout if you're at a speed that you'll get away with if you're bracing yourself. And actually, if you go down to a red shutter speed, the camera is basically telling you, put me on a tripod, I simply cannot be handheld at this shutter speed. The shutter is fully locked when it's pointing at the orange dot. Here, the grip and the threaded release cannot operate it. And when it's in the sideways position, the shutter button itself works to release the shutter. Leave it locked in the bag so you don't waste your film. All right, that about wraps up the demonstration bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to load it and I guess we'll head out. I'll find somewhere to take some photos and show off what the, the Bronica can do. If you've loaded the medium format film camera back before, they are all pretty much the same. There's not too much different with this Bronica one. Essentially, you have to put the take-up spool on the uh, the kind of the fresh windy one the uh, you can tell which one it is because there's the little crank that allows you to advance your film with it and uh, the actual roll itself wraps around the back of the little spools so that obviously it, it passes behind the shutter if um, if you have trouble with it just uh, take it slow and uh, make sure that you've got your spool the right way up obviously you want the the near edge to um, the back to be where the film comes off, because if it comes off the other side, you will expose the back of your film. Once you've threaded it through, it's just a case of making sure that it's got a nice purchase on the spool and just uh, wind it a couple of times until the arrow appears. If you haven't got a spare take-up spool, you can always get one by asking any lab that develops medium format film, because obviously the end process of loading one of these onto a development tank is to have one of the little plastic things left over. But yeah, make sure that the arrow lines up with a little red arrow and you'll be good to go. It seats on and closes up and clips back onto the camera. Once you've got your back closed, it's just a case of folding out that little winder and winding that until the one appears in the little window to let you know that you're on your first frame and that your back is ready to shoot. Okay, so rather than my usual London walkabout, I'm actually out in the countryside now. I'm, I'm up the Thames, maybe about 30, 40 miles. This is Hurley. It's near Henley on Thames, and my plan today is basically to walk up the river, maybe as far as Henley, maybe not. I've got my roll of portrait loaded, and I've actually taken my first couple of shots of this bridge. Um, what have I got? 12 shots left. Let's see what I can get. So here's my first shot. It's a little footbridge crossing the Thames near Hurley. I guess I was drawn to the moss on the uh, on the wood of the bridge and how it's kind of nestled in the trees. This second shot gives you a closer look of how it really does drop you in on the other bank amongst the foliage. Here's the view from the bridge itself, looking upriver. So I'm looking west out towards um, out towards Henley. The light's a bit flat, but it's a nice river scene. You have the, uh, the reflection of the water and a couple of boats down on the left. I guess I'm not just reviewing the body as well. This is a little punch in. Let's have a look at the detail the 75 millimeter lens non can produce. It's not like Hasselblad and Mimir are way out ahead doing different things with the lenses. The detail is here. And obviously if you are coming from 35 mil, you do get a lot crisper, a lot more sort of uh, fine detail in the negatives, which might be one of the reasons you're looking to move up. On the inland side of the riverbank, there was a little goat farm. Uh, I couldn't resist. I took a couple of pictures of these little lads enjoying their hay. I know I've already talked about it, but the detail in these shots surprised me. 
I think this was shot probably around 5.6 f8, but look at that. You can just about see the grain and uh, the shot detail in the horns and hair. I think this one felt left out when I took a picture of the other ones, so I also graced him with a quick frame. I know you guys are here for the photography and not for the nature documentary, but I saw these goslings. I couldn't resist taking a quick shot. This is the, the last animal one though, don't worry. So I've walked up maybe, maybe half a mile. Um, to be honest, this camera is so much easier to use in auto exposure mode that I might as well just keep going with that. I am, um, uh, it's, it's not the most sort of active scene. It's uh, a lot of animals. I mean, we've got the, the geese and the ducks and whatever, but there's probably enough for me to finish the roll. Um, you've already seen some photos. I guess I'll try and take another five or six like that. In terms of the meter accuracy, this is the only shot that I overrode the meter on because I was worried that the bright sky behind it would cause the foreground to be underexposed. I, um, I, I bumped up the exposure compensation by a stop and as you can see, the colors have gone a bit weird. I, uh, I would say that the Bronica A prism is trustworthy, maybe more trustworthy than me. After taking those shots, I wandered back towards Hurley Village. Um, this is a shot of the church in the village and I just about wrapped up my trip, but I still had a couple of pictures left on the roll, so I had to work out something to do with those. So I took a couple of pictures of my new family puppy. Um, to be honest, I mean, it's what you're gonna do, isn't it? If you have one shot left on the roll, you are gonna take a picture of the puppy. But I think it also gives me a moment to talk about quite how versatile the ETRS is, because new puppies, famously, they don't sit still, they don't stop for that long. So it's a breeze to focus. And having that auto exposure just gives you the ability to uh, have nothing else in your hands. You just have the camera, the focusing ring, and you've preset your aperture. It just does the job. I know I said no more animal photos, but come on, you have to let her off. She's adorable. Time for me to wrap up. You've seen the photos. I've been rambling and walking, and now I'm back home. And having seen the photos, I'll give you a kind of breakdown of how I think this sits in the market and how it performs. Well, you've seen how it performs. There's nothing that the Hasselblad or Mamiya lenses are really going to do that outclass this lens on. It's not like you're going to get, I don't know, um, blazing fast autofocus or, or double the resolution if you, if you upgrade to one of the more expensive ones. And I have just checked the prices today. As of today, these go for about £500 on eBay. I do not think you can get a better kind of configurable package. If you think about the, the kind of things you can get for, for less, maybe you could pick up a Yashica Mat 124 if you wanted to shoot some TLR medium format. You could get those crazy cheap folding, um, you know, the ones that have the lens that like pops out. You, you don't get reliability when you go down that path. And not only do you get reliability, you get fantastic image quality. It really is a joy to use mechanically. And, uh, and having that ability to reconfigure it to suit your needs means that, yeah, I really do think this is the, the best bargain in medium format. I'm rambling a bit. I'm gonna wrap up the video and uh, I want to do a, a teaser for my next video. So I'm gonna do a video about light meters uh, and film. So if you are interested in that, you could subscribe. I think that will probably be out maybe next week, maybe in six months. That's how my upload schedule usually works. But thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time, whenever that is. Mm -hmm.